Welcome to the IBM Podcast Network. Welcome to Shunyawan episode 13, guys. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing very great. well. Great. So, great to have everyone listening back here. Uh, I think... I mean, I'm getting the hang of this now. Yes, you are. My, my, my radio voice, I, people have been telling me about my radio voice now. Oh. So uh, I'm happy. I'm <laughs> happy it's not annoying, uh, annoying too many people. But hey, welcome back, guys. Uh, I'm your host, Shila Ditya. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm the founder of Hipcask and Rasselin Technologies. And you can find me on Twitter at Shila Ditya. I'm joined here with Amit Doshi, my co-host. Where do we find you? Uh, Doshi Amit on Twitter. I guess that's the easiest one to do. Yep. Amit is obviously the founder and CEO of Indus Vox Media, which brings you this podcast along with a bunch of others. And joining me today is a very good friend and uh, yet another special guest of ours, uh, Pranav Marwa. Uh, you can find him on Twitter at Pranav Marwa. And Pranav is the founder of Thinkubate, the incubator. But before this, Pranav has done a bunch of stuff and uh, I'm happy to... Uh, talk to him today about his journey as well as the kind of challenges and opportunities he sees uh, being not just an investor, uh, but also working with entrepreneurs and also doing some very cool, interesting things uh, in the uh, in not so common spaces uh, such as sports. Thank you so much for having me on here, guys. Thanks, ah, Sheila, for no, we'll sort of inviting me over. Uh, been an avid listener over the last few episodes and sort of happy to be on here myself. But uh, just a little bit of context of who I am and where I come from. Um, I born and brought up in Bombay, went to law school, came back uh, to India working in commercial real estate, spent about five years doing that. Did a postgraduate in sports management because uh, that was something that I was always keen on pursuing and sort of landed myself more into sports tech and then sort of segueing into early stage investing. So it's been a strange yet sort of uh, interesting journey over the last, I would say, about 10 years um, in getting to know the Indian ecosystem a lot better and sort of embedding or trying to embed our approach to investing at an early stage um, into sort of the Indian context. So that's just a little bit about me and what, what I do. Yeah. Superb, superb. I'm, I'm so happy you're here, Pranav. I mean, thanks for joining us. And uh, I know I know you as uh, the founder of Thinkubate and all this stuff, like, in your recent past and what you're doing now. But I think uh, you've had, like you mentioned, since graduating from law and uh, then doing a sports uh, degree, you've actually been involved in a lot of other interesting side projects as well. Uh, I know we were just talking about a Twitter handle or a, a fan page which you were known famously for. Can, can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I started something when I was when I was back in college, um, along along with my cousin, um, who is a stand up comic in Bombay, and um, it went by Cricket Gandu. Um, right. I'm okay to say that here, right? Yeah, so it went point. by it went by Cricket Gandu. Um, started off in the mid 2000s, well, early stage of Twitter's sort of inlay into the Indian early adopter Twitter ecosystem to some extent. Right. Um, did that and sort of made some side money <laughs> whilst uh, <laughs> at college and doing a bunch of things because there was not many people doing it back then as well. Right. right. And I was always passionate about sports. So it was a it was a platform for me to maybe vent and, and sort of let the world know of my thoughts and opinions. So were you as uh, like kind of... Uh, Poking people in the eye as Karan was? Oh, absolutely. I think I got it from him to a large <laughs> okay. extent. Um, I, I got the approach and the the understanding of how to even deal with people on a platform like that from him. <laughs> okay. Um, nice. And I was telling you guys, like, the context of where he started and where we sort of we started together and right. where the direction which he sort of went has been incredible. And it's yeah. been incredible for me to sort of see that journey too. But simultaneously in the, in the cricket ecosystem, I think it's been insane. There's yeah, yeah. so many fantastic yeah. uh, folks out there on mm -hmm. Twitter still. Um, but the, it's been, a, it's been a great journey understanding the platform too. Yeah, no, I can, I can only imagine, right? Cause I mean, like when you're doing that, you're going to get a lot of the negative reactions and you're going to get a lot of that kind of stuff. So you really, it would really, I think be like a masterclass in how to deal with the uh, trolls. Well, but you're, you're kind of a semi troll yourself, right? In this, so in this strange, context. So, so yeah, I, I would definitely <laughs> agree that, but to a strange extent, I think back then there was a lot more acceptance for, uh, I never abused. I don't right. think I ever sort of directly abused someone or insulted someone. Uh, it was it was about wit. 
It was right. about whether you could make someone laugh, right. whether you could make someone laugh at themselves. And I think I got some sort of validation and not abusing folks when I had a bunch of Indian cricketers who were actually following me and constantly oh, sending messages and um, sort of being able to laugh at themselves. That's um, good. And that was actually pretty awesome back then. In today's day and age, there's far too many trolls out there who right. are uh, abusing and, and sort of trying to incite some sort of that's <laughs> That's reaction. actually really interesting because, I mean, like, one of the... So I was listening to a podcast recently uh, where they were talking about... Uh, I'm a big NBA fan, right? So it was an NBA podcast, and they were talking about uh, how controlled athletes are today about their messaging. Uh, yeah, it's become it's become serious business. They're yeah, spokespersons exactly. for it's, their own brand. It, it is their brand, right? I mean, like the, their main brand channels are essentially their social media channels. So they were talking about this in context of LeBron James and how he controls every aspect of his particular social media presence. So it's really interesting that you were getting like direct responses from athletes back in that time. Yeah, and and they were sort of more than happy to partake in the humor too. That's, um, and it wasn't necessarily just. Uh, somebody playing a Ranji trophy or right. um, I had a lot of folks who I used to interact with the Mumbai Ranji team because mm. I was also an ardent follower of Ranji trophy right. mm. and I was a big Mumbai supporter um, and, and so I used to interact with the folks quite pre- regularly um, especially in the support team Okay, and even with the Indian team, I had I had for a while. Dinesh Karthik used to send across a bunch of uh, hahas and sort of good responses to every time he found something funny. He got his wife started following me on 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 Twitter simultaneously. Ravi Chandra Ashwin's wife, okay, one of the funniest sort of I would say. Yeah cricket wife tweeter okay. where she's unbelievably funny even in her own right as well and someone who's really lovely to follow and interact with um, and I think I've just made some interesting um, conversations and it's sort of given me a very different context to um, all of the, the athletes and the, the cricketers themselves because it went from a period of being trying to be witty enough to incite a response to sort of being respectful enough to right. uh, knowing the context yet trying to be sort of smart right. and witty about right, it. Right, 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 right. No, and over time, I mean, this was also a time when uh, the platform, like you said, was starting out and hence people were also much more open and mm-hmm. like you said, right, now Twitter has become I mean, for someone who has a decent following, it's pretty much it's a mouthpiece for it uh, is, yeah. what kind of information they want to direct. Mm-hmm. So a lot more people and and cricket also over year over the years last like ten years it's the IPL years it's been crazy yeah. so, so uh, it's become super professional but do you I think, think that's where I mean I wanted to actually uh, jump into how by doing this right understanding you can say the side of a sports person and how they live their life how your interest in sports and the degree you did and so on. Uh, how how has that continued into what you even do today? And how is that like, I know you also run a sports business and I, I want to talk yeah. about more about that. But is this uh, the ability to understand a person who is into sports and the ability to uh, sort of uh, identify traits in people who I who have some connection to sports? Do you think uh, that's an important part of uh, being an entrepreneur and being a technology is huge I think it's I think it's huge I think um, I've been a big believer of sport being intrinsic to should be intrinsic to everybody's life uh, from a very very early age because I think it's a very undervalued source of skill sets Mm -hmm. uh, where you can acquire them in a manner that you possibly don't even realize Um, and that could be with individual sport when it comes to discipline and sort of understanding how to um, keep pushing yourself when you're perhaps alone Mm -hmm. Then coming to a team sport where it's understanding how to deal with others and understanding the other's weakness and sort of jumping when it's needed. I think that's something that you see, especially in entrepreneurship, in the world of entrepreneurship and and startups. Um, It's extremely important for the foundation of the company to have that sort of camaraderie and uh, interaction. And I think that translates over very, very naturally um, in what an individual can or can't do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, that's true. I mean, I mean, I... I'm only into running okay. uh, and I realized that something I, I got into uh, very early on in my entrepreneurship days simply because it was the one thing I could find time for without having to schedule with anyone else and it sort of mm-hmm. got me alone with my thoughts and all of that and it's g- generally great for energy and endorphins, right? So, and so likewise, any other sport mm-hmm. actually energizes you and your body and hence your mind right. uh, into... Uh, 
You're yeah, concentrating but, on just that at that point in time, right? You, the, yeah, it, yeah. it is focus. complete focus. You can't... Uh, and, and that focus then translates to the other aspects of your life. So. Exactly. No, but I, I think also there is something to be said for the fact that since you're completely focused on one thing, you're not thinking about... As entrepreneurs, you have stress. You need to detach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. This, this lets you kind of just like, okay, I'm not thinking about that at all. I'm spending all of my energy and all of my attention on this particular kind of thing. So I think yeah. that's no, very... So, and I think it's a very not... Uh, not so spoken about con- uh, conversation in the context of tech, right? Yeah. I mean, in the context of entrepreneurship, even in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, but since you've seen this firsthand, and since you've uh, even so now to come to talk about the sports businesses you've run, I mean, how hard or difficult is it to uh, you know even be in the business of sports in a city like Mumbai, where hardly any fields are there, hardly mm-hmm. any you know there's recreational facilities for especially for sporting activities are so limited so i think we've seen a massive shift in the last maybe year and a half at least with sort of um facility development where you've seen a i think <laughs> so what so let me give a little context so when i when i started out sort of trying to bring tech and sport into mass market in the bombay context or mumbai context at the outset uh, it was a very um what i thought at that time what our people around me more than me thought at that time was a little bit of a foolhardy move. I tried to bring uh, golf simulation and golf simulator machines to the Mumbai context. Um, a city and a state where golf is not necessarily a prevalent sport. You go up north, you see a lot more uh, golf. We have, what, three courses in Mumbai? Yeah, you got US Club, uh, you Chambur. have Chambur and Willingdon. That's, and uh, Royal Palms. Yeah, Royal Palms. So four, four facilities in the city. Um, where, again, access is extremely limited mm-hmm. um, to folks that are members uh, yep. and sometimes prohibitively expensive if yeah. you're not a member. Right. Um, so it's not something that you do normally, uh, but it's a very aspirational sport. It is. Um, and golf was always perceived to be a sort of an elite sport. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and the idea for me was that can I actually bridge the, the gap? That, you know what, can I take the simulate, can I take the location to the individual? And what I realized, honestly, over two and a half years at the outset was people want to aspire, but people don't necessarily know how to. Right. Um, And I think that was a bigger problem to solve than sort of telling them how to uh, not play cricket, but actually improve their swing to make it seem more golf-like, if I may. So the education part of of sort of getting people there was one of the hardest challenges to face. But the shift is happening. I think over the last few years like i said sort of infrastructure has been developing mm-hmm. we ourselves tied up with uh, with the mumbai district football association to right. sort of do grassroots infrastructure development and turf development in the city and state too and that should i think that's the outlook going forward uh, we have close to i think about 95 turfs um, in mumbai and navi mumbai region okay. uh, that have sprung over the last two two and a half years and it's not the average corporate that's going out and opening turfs there are right. guys who play and know their local area really well. They play right. four times a week. They hustled, got some money together, and set up a turf. So that's literally where it's sort of getting to, where mm. people are being enterprising. Uh, right. People are being proactive in, in trying to give that opportunity to the market. Interesting, yeah. yeah and that's because, again, uh, this sense of awareness about the fact that sports plays a role in your life, even if you're not a sportsman. Right. Yeah. You know, that awareness as a city-dwelling person is, I think, all the more... Uh, or when it hits you, it really hits you uh, right. because it, you realize that you're so disconnected from sports after your younger days when you first have played in school or college right. at whatever midlife crisis yeah. stage you might be in. When you realize it, you go hard on it. I think. <laughs> no, and I, I think, think the shift to sort of urban cities in, in general. I think even right. cricket. Okay, if you take the the most common denominator example in the mm-hmm. Indian ecosystem, twenty years ago, a majority of the creators in the Indian cricket team. Uh, were from urban areas. They were from Bombay. metro cities. Bombay. Bombay was a stronghold. Bombay was a stronghold. Time. Yeah. Um, you saw a lot from Bangalore, from yep. Chennai, yep. Uh, a few from Delhi, Kolkata. Kolkata. Today, if you look at the Indian context from again, everywhere. Delhi is again. A, you've had a little bit more from Delhi, but if you look at the greater context, it's all from smaller cities. Yeah. Um, it's all from humble backgrounds. It's all who have sort of slogged their behinds off. Not right. to say the earlier earlier. No, but I mean, like, there is a difference, right? I mean, like uh, the. Uh, the cricketers from the the ones in the seventies and eighties were people who, but you had the ability to kind of uh, well, your the privilege of privilege cricket. of yeah. cricket exactly. There, there was privilege there. Yeah. I mean, like whereas now it is something which is being and I think in fact that's a that's a sort of an indicator of the underlying mentality shift also that yeah. cricket, like sports is not 
something that's necessarily important to every parent if right. I may, or every school or every student right I think you give the student an opportunity to say hey listen when you're younger just go out and play like find your favorite sport and play I find it hard to believe that most kids will say no. Yeah. Maybe they'll go onto a computer and play some Dota or they'll play something. They'll play something. They'll yeah. play something. Yeah. Right. right? Um, so if that's the default reaction of the child in that scenario, then where does the hurting need to sort of come right. from? Yeah. No, and again, in the context that we're speaking of, yeah. I, uh, you know, I mean, like the physical activity is important. So Absolutely. I mean, like from that context, yeah, sports. But I think what we're talking about here, when we're talking about it from the perspective of uh human development and stuff yeah. like that. I think in that context, it's more about competition and game yeah. playing and teamwork and those so kinds of things. I'll give you an example. Like, I mean, so we're coming back to what, what I sort of do on a regular basis, which is at Thinkubate, we're an incubator with early stage investment. Mm-hmm. I think we've actually used sport to uh, get to know an entrepreneur or a founding team yeah. much better, a lot more regularly mm-hmm. uh, because it's so important. Like when you, so we have four pillars we like to sort of uh, adhere by or, or work towards where we're early stage companies in industries we can bring value, which are enabled by technology, but backed by the most solid founding team. Okay. And that last element is perhaps 95% of the entire outlook. Right. Because it's all about people, mm-hmm. right? When it's a four person company um, working out of a small 400 square foot, 200 square foot room, right. that's not where you're judging the business. You're judging the founder's ability to drive the business. Right. Their decision-making ability under pressure. Mm-hmm. How they react to a teammate making a mistake. And I think you have much greater opportunity to see that in the sporting context rather than just like them pitching to you a business idea. Yeah, that's all rehearsed. I mean, like, let's all be honest about that. I mean, like yeah, the rehearsal and, that goes into that stuff is like not trivial, right? I mean, like it's, yeah. uh, those pitches are crafted and like, you know, every pitch that you do leads to like uh, polishing it for like the next yeah. one. So, I mean, like, you know, the, the, the true uh, reactions you get in sports, yeah. I think I can absolutely see that being really valuable to you. No, And, and also, I mean, since you're looking at early stage investing, early stage, it, it is like you said, it's a, uh, such a gray area at, for the business anyway at that stage uh, and judging the entrepreneur is the most uh, critical part of your job I mean you should be able to know that this guy can you know make it until he has to but how how do you bring that in uh, how do you bring sports in uh, on day one like do you say oh stop this pitch let's go play some cricket <laughs> I wish we could I, I wish I could do all pitches on the on the cricket field or on the on the football field but um that's unfortunately not the case but um I think once we've initiated some sort of dialogue uh we've tried to create opportunities where a game can happen I'll give you again another example of the the last batch of last cycle of investments that we made um there was a company there is a company that Four founders from Bizpilani had already uh, done a successful uh, venture to begin with that they sort of pivoted and sold off. And they were now moving into sort of more driving analytics and and that whole domain. Mm -hmm. And my first interaction with them was when they came over to the office uh, looking to sort of have me part of the round of, of investment that was going on. And we spent about two hours just generally chatting about everything they do and what why they're doing it. And... When they were leaving at the end of the day, I showed them. So I have a few turfs in the city too. Mm -hmm. So I showed them a turf at the location that we're at. And they were just generally talking about the game they were playing that night. And they were playing a game in Bandra. And um, they just happened to mention that, hey, listen, uh, we have one spot empty. And I was like, hey, you know what? Can I join? And they were like, oh, yeah, cool. Do you you live in Bandra? I was like, yeah, yeah, I just live close by. Happy to join in. Play a game of 90 minutes. Next morning... I was quite certain that I wanted to work with these guys. Mm-hmm. Simultaneously, they came forward and said, "Look, let's do something together." So I don't think it was just a case of right. me judging them. Right. I think it was also a case of them sort of, with their filters right. on me to a certain extent. You know, sort of alien environment with nobody else I knew there. Met these four guys for the first time in my life, right. and it just kicked off. So yeah, I think it just happens. Yeah, I understand the context where, especially in a group sport, even within minutes of starting out playing a sport together, you are your intrinsic trust with each other has to sort of develop, right? right? You have to immediately be able to uh, bond, coordinate, trust each other for whatever you're doing and have a common goal. I think think that sort of brings out the... You know, literally what you just said, if you said it to someone without the context of sport right now, they'll probably think you're talking about entrepreneurship. Yeah. Or, or a founding team, and that I think is such a <laughs> such a direct indication of what the essence is like, uh, and how yeah. easily it actually translates over as well. It's it's funny to see not more people encouraging sports at the early stage, but it's it's great that you're doing it. And I think uh, coming to even the 
what you do at Think of it, right? Since we uh, started talking about it, beyond just uh, obviously seeing the value in the entrepreneur and you know trying to do even with the space you have, uh, what what's what's your overall message? I mean, why do you think? How important is the kind of handholding you're doing at yeah, the stage? I, yeah, I think that companies. would be a really interesting thing. I mean, yeah. like, how would you contrast yourself from like a VC, which is not an incubator kind of this, right? Yeah, I mean, like we've had other yeah, people yeah, on here yeah, exactly, who are just right? I mean, like, pure angel just pure investor, angel investor, investor. Just so put some money in, whereas you are providing a certain amount of infrastructure, a certain yeah. amount of guidance in certain areas. You have so how how do you see? Uh, what, so I think the the. What we like to believe in some ways is a differentiator is that we're just trying to be a little bit more structured. The okay. average angel investor to a large extent would be um, strategic uh, with capital, but not necessarily with time. And that often can be a, I wouldn't say a barrier, but I think that there are certain things that value can solve that or time can solve that money really or, or a lead in business development really can't solve. Mm-hmm. And early stage, I think sometimes the time and the value, no, I'm, not, I'm not saying it from my individual right. point of view, but I'm saying from a sector specific individual point of view is often very, very important. Right. Yeah, um, absolutely. 101%. And, and so the way we try to approach it is that, look, can we empower the entrepreneur and the founder to have all the resources, right. uh, make mistakes if they do, but just ensure they don't make the same mistake twice. Right. We never tell anyone what to do. I think that's one of the greatest validations I'm proud to probably say that if anybody goes and asks any of our sort of portfolio company founders um, and asks them a question of, did these did they ever tell you that, no, listen, this is what you have to do? Right. Uh, I don't think that was ever the case. We're, we're a soldier on the team. Uh, I do sales calls. I do vendor meets. Uh, I do investor relations. We do product branding strategy. Okay. Um, there's nothing that I'm not necessarily intrinsically a part of myself across the entire portfolio. So that's that's I think that's been one of the I think, or I'd like to believe a, a difference with how an average individual angel investor who's perhaps signing a check and giving maybe two hours or three hours a week, right? Uh, in comparison to me and our team of eight individuals and my partners sitting there, constantly plugging in the right industry mentors, right? Um, and just being a soldier in the team. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, no, that sounds great. I mean, I I, I, I see the value in this, right? I mean, I definitely uh, see that that would be an important thing for. Especially if you are, uh, and a lot of early stage things right now, right, are coming out from people straight from college. So they really don't have the connections needed. So being able to kind of like help with that kind of stuff, I, 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 I don't think that that can be understated how important it is. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I feel like people don't necessarily realize what founders actually need at mm-hmm. an early stage. So all yeah. of the companies that we invested in to begin with were raising a couple of crores, two and a half crores, and they were looking to raise rather right. a larger sort of angel round. Mm. Um, we ran a 12-month incubation cycle. Okay. And we were able to sort of show them the value of saying, you don't need two and a half crore rupees in 12 months. Right. You need actually, you actually need about 20 lakhs of capital. Right. And you need just the support and the ancillary services mm. and then focus on product development. You keep creating value through your product. Right. You don't worry about the money. The money will follow you in some shape or form. Right, whether it be through revenue or through investors saying that, hey, listen, I want to play a part. Right, right, um, and that's the entire focus. That look at the earlier stage. Don't shell out twenty five percent of your equity, man. Twenty mm-hmm. percent of your equity to angel investors. If they're that strategic, that they can bring you to a certain revenue scale, right. obviously, yeah. there's a different scenario. But on average, you don't need to. Yeah. You don't uh, need to give away that sort of precious equity from your company at an early stage for unoptimized. Uh, sort of returns on yeah, it. It's especially when you're still like far from knowing what your product's going to look like, right? I mean, like, um, I mean, like you, we've, all, we've, we've spoken about this before. We've dealt with this before, right? I mean, the actual product that comes out is often so very different, different. from what the idea is or what the business model is. What it that was on the pitch deck. Yeah, yeah, as opposed to a pitch deck. So yeah, it absolutely makes sense not to, at the same time, I understand people wanting a certain amount of kind of leeway to do what they need to yeah. do. So they, people do tend to overraise. It's a tough, it's a tough kind of this, right? Because I mean, like you do want a certain war chest. Yeah. But at the same time, raising too much is everything, every penny you raise is something you're giving up in equity for the long run. And if you believe in your business in the long run that's not a good thing either absolutely and I think we had this conversation once I had this conversation with Shalin Shalin Shah Mm -hmm. um, and we were talking about the the perils of too much money Um, and I think we've seen that in the Indian ecosystem quite perfectly Um, we've seen so many issues at an early stage mid stage late stage with just too much money. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think that's a problem either of us face. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but 
what you're saying about not just about too much money but also at the early stage i i, I agree with the point about diluting too much early on i mean yeah. i know even when i was in the same position myself and other founders i've seen they don't care about your equity dilution on day one yeah. you know they think that okay i'm at we're at 100 today so okay fine i'm letting go whatever i right. need, need to just get started yeah. and they are actually probably undervaluing themselves or undervaluing that equity in yeah, some yeah. way you know either by giving it off just to get some a little more in the bank mm-hmm. uh, or because they're not thinking through how much more they'll need right and hence doing a wrong value so a lot of things when you're starting you just think i can i just need something yeah. and that's when uh, i think uh, someone even yeah. the mentorship you provide to not to tweak that model yeah. i think is also very important no and i think like people are often chasing the wrong thing i've like i think over the last 3 years i've met so many founders startups entrepreneurs i must have hit every event in the indian ecosystem over mm-hmm. the last 3 years and it's unbelievable actually how many founders are actually chasing funding yeah and thankfully over the last year i've seen a little bit of a transition from 3 years ago to now where instead when starting up they're chasing funding they're not chasing like the building product. a kick ass product yeah. yeah they're not chasing being the next self sustainable revenue generating profit making business they want to be the next unicorn who has x raised. capital y capital yeah. has sort of right. deployed a few hundred crores into their business and that's it's not necessarily a good thing well i mean i it, well i mean like yeah it's not i mean like you know to the if there's no fundamental model behind these things if your product is not workable if you don't have a long term plan for what you're going to go through with then it's disastrous to have yeah. too much money right i mean like you get uh you, you you get stupid situations right you get the whatever the indian equivalent of pets.com is or whatever you know i mean like you get yeah. those kinds of things things which are just not ready for prime time yeah. No, and uh, again, the fact that the you're seeing this changing, the fact that you're seeing the glory of to of funding being a milestone at an early stage, sort of changing. I mean, I don't know if it's changing at the very early stage too, because I feel when people start out, even today, uh, entrepreneurs think that okay, I am quitting my job or I'm not joining a job and. i need to feed myself and all of that so money is definitely important but uh, i can understand where uh, and we're going to talk a bit more about that uh, about how much more value can be added at the early stage without just money so I, i think there's else. fear of not having a runway right i mean like i think that uh, we use the yeah. word runway just generally but there's a certain amount of fear that if i don't have enough to sustain myself for a long period of time how will i get people on board because and and that is a thing i i mean like you know i'll be straight honest i mean like you know about this i never tell anybody how much runway i have left because mm-hmm. you tell anybody in organization how much you have left and they'll freak the Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean like uh it's just not a conversation you want to have with anybody. Yeah. So I mean like you know, so I get the entrepreneur who wants to raise enough so that they're clear, but at the same time too much money is a bad thing, giving up too much is a bad thing, having somebody over invested in a business before it has a path to profitability yeah. is a bad thing because all of a sudden now you have investor pressure in a way which is not pleasant. And that's actually why we sort of trying to do precisely that is give the yeah. security of time yeah um we 12 months is a long time is, to yeah. sort of build out a base mm-hmm. and really understand yeah. what you want to do and yeah. what you, what can be done absolutely yeah. so i mean so when it comes to like providing context for what support can be even given in some way like let the founder build product yeah. hire people only who build product yeah. right. at at thinkubate we try and take care of everything else yeah right. from yeah. accounts to all portfolio services are standard um mm-hmm. but they don't there's no outflow of cash right we're not a co-working space they're not paying me to sit there i have equity in the company mm-hmm. and i work with aligned interests um if i'm charging them 3 grand a seat for a 12 month period um what's the point of me giving them any capital yeah exactly i might, might as well net that and give them the capital right yeah uh, we're not here to book build right. <laughs> we're hopefully here to sort of try and yeah you want to get people to build, build value product. Yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. great i i mean i think on that note we're going to take a quick break cool. uh, come back and talk some more Are you confused about your future education options? Not sure about whether you should be doing an MBA or if design school is the right fit for you? Are you worried about how you would finance your education? Find answers to this and a lot more education related topics on this podcast. Hi, my name is Akhil Daswani. I'm the CEO and co-founder of OnCourse. Hi, my name is Alisha Mashruwala. I'm the CEO and co-founder of OnCourse. And we both are your co-hosts for the OnCourse podcast. 
Tune in every Monday on the IBM podcast app or any other podcast app you may like. Hey, welcome back. And uh, it's been a good chat. We've been talking a lot about how, uh, uh, you know, how Thinkubate operates. And uh, like you said, it's a sort of a unique model in terms of not just not just a bunch of cash and infrastructure, but it's also a lot of hand-holding and mentorship and sort of uh, services you provide as an ancillary to, uh, you know, just just the investment. So I actually want to understand. I mean, I know we hear about accelerators and incubators a lot. In fact, over the last three years, that also has been on a sort of a hype machine that, you know, there's one springing up everywhere and there's uh, uh, the government has funded some and so on. So... What do you think in general about this space? Like as an accelerator incubator space, what do you think? I know definitely it's useful for some, but the way you guys do it, why do you think that's uh, relevant? So I think till till a few years back, there was sort of three macro heads of of accelerators, incubators that you could bucket Mm -hmm. them into where you had an educational institution incubator accelerator like SIGN and CIIE. You had the angel network slash sort of fund back. Matrix had a space in Chandivili and various people are sort of trying to push the envelope there. And then you have your sort of corporate accelerators like your Target, Microsoft, Google, right. everybody has there. Where we wanted to actually come in and sort of dif- differentiate ourselves is being a privately held, privately vested, independent opportunity that actually plugs into all three of them. The biggest problem in anybody else in this given scenario that we also are is if someone's providing the capital, they're actually hiring someone to run it. If someone is looking to actually go out there and start it themselves, then they may not actually go out there and bite the bullet. What we've honestly tried to do is back ourselves saying, look, this is our capital. This is our corpus. We're mm-hmm. going to make educated decisions based on our experience and our understanding. And we're going to constantly try and give context, okay. play devil's advocate, be that dirty conscience on sitting on the founder's shoulder in getting them to always cross their T's and dot their I's in every domain. Mm-hmm. Um, and when it comes to the sort of the competition in this landscape, I think it's so early that there can be a hundred or maybe a thousand more in the Indian context um, that can really sprout up and do much better than most existing today. Right. I'll be blunt in saying that a lot of the existing institutionally run uh, platforms normally provide just capital yeah. and workspace and yeah. things like that. Time value of money is what we try and propagate is extremely, extremely critical, right. not just from a mentor point of view, but from a founder's like how he deploys his resources or how he allocates yeah, right, his resources. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, and, and that's you, why I like, yeah, sorry. So, you know, you had mentioned that you guys provide accounting services and stuff like that. That's, I think, massive, right? I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, like, so at this point, even, uh, so we run fairly, like, not mature startups, but like, you know, we've been around for a bit. I still don't have a full-time accountant. Yeah. You know, because yeah. uh, I don't need one, but exactly. I still don't have one, right? You're going to get one at HipCast. <laughs> <laughs> Because we're just tired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, and see, that's that's the exact thing, right? I mean, at an early stage, do you really want to be spending time on ensuring that every entry is perfect, all compliances are fulfilled, right. your taxes have been filed, your board resolutions for oh, a man. particular thing have been put in place? <laughs> uh, you don't, as a new or even an established entrepreneur, want to spend time doing this. Right. You know you have to. Yeah. Well, to be fair, there's a lot that don't even know that they necessarily have to. Right. Uh, but when you know you have to, you still don't want to do it. Right. So we're more than happy to always sort of soak up the grunt work and say, listen, when you need to sign off, we'll bring it to you. You can vet it, sign right. it off, and we're good to go. Right. So our accounts team that sits there is dedicated days where everything is being done. Emails are being shot out for sort of approval. And it's a very sort of seamless pop operation in that way, the process we've tried to put together. And the same with legal, tax, compliances, um, all across the board. So not just daily accounting, but right. also sort of general back-end stuff. Um, wow, I, that's yeah. a massive that's actually, yeah. thing you're taking off of people's shoulders, by the way. Yeah, Let me tell you. No, I mean, like, I stuff mean, like trademarks and stuff I like that. Understand. I mean, like, no, I mean, like, that stuff takes forever, man. Trademark yeah. and stuff. It's just, like, it's a time sink, right? So, yeah. I mean, like, if... Uh, there is hope in that kind of stuff for people who yeah. is, is that that's amazing. Yeah, so if we can be the hands and legs from yeah. time to time and sort of just get things done, mm-hmm. we're always more than happy to do it. Uh, I'll be scared of uh, people never wanting to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so we're coming to the end of a twelve-month cycle as well. Okay. I think we're in that phase to some extent too, uh, where where we're seeing I wouldn't say uh, pushback, but we're seeing folks suddenly asking the questions but hey listen what's going to happen after after the end of the coming month yeah. like uh, how do we transition and what I'm, does happen so I made this like well they called me crazy but I made a, a sort of a three page exit checklist 
um, on wow. possible things that okay. entrepreneurs should think of when moving office. Like mm-hmm. across compliance, does your CS need to have again a board resolution drafted for um, change of registered address? Do they need to affect that in your AOA? Uh, does that need to go on to MCA website? Do you need to file wow. to the ROC? Uh, we've sort of just tried to put, put together a hygiene checklist in saying that, look, you have digital hygiene that you may maintain across social media, right, right. but what about sort of like your, your financial hygiene right. and your compliance hygiene? Because mm-hmm. that's, when you go into a situation of diligence and hopefully for some startups when they do manage to raise more capital, right. you're just making it easier for yourself. If you're yeah, doing yeah. these things to begin with, you're making it easier for of yourself. Course, of course. I've seen last year TDS not filed in a startup for 14 months. Like there's, there's nothing. There's no, yeah, there's service a, tax was not filed. I've seen that. TDS I've not, that. nothing. I, I, listen, I'll be honest. I've done that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, so that's where, that's where we come. <laughs> so sometimes the diligence process yeah. takes about three months yeah. because you're not actually doing diligence in the company, yeah. but you're just like, Picking up their slack. Yeah, you're just Pretty. picking up their slack. You learn, right? I yeah. mean, like when I was doing it, this was not now. I mean, like this was when I first started. I, I mean, like, you know, it was, I was 25. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Yeah. And uh, so no TDS, no this, yeah. no that, no PF. Yeah. And then all of it comes at the same time. Professional tax. Oh, Professional I could have tax. a list. <laughs> Professional tax. So that's tax. exactly what we try. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, so that's, see, again, this is something... Uh, so relevant to early stage, especially for uh, freeing up even the mind space of an entrepreneur. Uh, as a founder, I know if I have someone on my team mm-hmm. who is going to take care of this stuff for me, I am that much not, I'm that much less worried about you it. Know, and yeah. hence, I have more mind space to actually focus on my product. Exactly. Yeah. So beyond just, again, if beyond an angel investor who just gives you money, you still have to do this. And I think that's where uh, you do play a That's also where role. the inherent challenge sometimes lays because this is financial information that's very sensitive to your business. Right. right. So do you have the implicit trust in the individual and the organization to say that, look, I'm actually going to just hand this over to you to take care of? That's, uh, um, because where does that trust come yeah, from? No, that, if you're beyond it's, trusting your CA. Yeah. yeah. No, but it, it's tough, anyway right? I mean, like, trust. so again, remember we were talking about those professional accounting organizations, right? Yeah. So I started looking into a couple of them right after we were talking about that. And uh, there is an issue over there. I mean, like, I'm not so comfortable with the idea of having everything run through a outside accountant. Mm-hmm. A CA has a different responsibility, has a different relationship with me. So, I mean, like him handling things is one thing. But going to a professional accounting firm, I did not feel a degree of comfort. And yeah. I'm not saving so much money. I can get somebody in for like maybe 25, 30% more. So then, I mean, like it doesn't, it didn't really make sense to me to go for that kind yeah. of a service. No, that, that's, I, I think that's the case again. Yeah. I mean, I'm extremely sensitive about uh, handing over information about my company yeah. or any of our portfolio companies mm-hmm. to anybody else. Yeah. Um, and that's for precisely that reason because you don't know who to trust. And that yeah. for us is the biggest challenge from day one is that can we build the trust with founders to yeah. have them realize that, look, we're not trying to make a buck off of you. The only way I can actually make a buck, or maybe I hate calling and making a buck, but uh, the only way I can be successful or the organization can be successful is when you succeed. Right. I'm not charging you a fee to be here. Yeah. I have equity in your company. Yeah. You do well, I'll hopefully uh, get an exit one day. Exactly, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So your interests are aligned and the soft trust and soft power, comes if I that. may, sort of starts yeah. coming through. Yeah, yeah, it comes through that. Yeah, I, I can absolutely see that. No, and definitely at the, and the kind of being co-located also, right? You also yeah. sit out of there yeah. and providing all these services. I think that comes back to the initial conversation which we were having about how judging the person and bonding with that person even for you and the entrepreneur themselves is so much more important uh, and you're doing that at at the initial stages when you decide to go in and when you decide to get them on your portfolio and they also likewise uh, understand you yeah. uh, that's where it builds up from uh, after that they are okay with sharing all these things and then absolutely and yeah. that's what that's the crazy part the minute you the entrepreneur's mind space is freed up that you're one of the team um, it's sometimes truly insane and magical the kind of right. conversations you can have and the kind of things that you can think of because you're not looking at it from a competitive mind sca- yeah. uh, from a, a sort of a, a mind space um, you're looking at it more from a look, I just have more hands on, sort of mm-hmm. hands on deck, feet on ground um, to go out there and, and help us strategize or execute, whatever it may be. Right. right so right. in 12 months, again, since uh, since you're just closing your first, uh, your first uh, say, cohort, what do you, what do you, what can you give us uh, in terms of learnings as not just by, as a person running an incubator, but 
also benefits to your own portfolio like people who are listening who are founders who are potentially have thought about you know joining hands with an incubator mm-hmm. or otherwise what have you really seen their growth to be in these all of these uh, 12 months i think the for us what what's been the the greatest thing to actually see is the growth of each of the individuals and that's what we hope for to begin with that can each of these individuals actually grow to not want to hide their ideas to hide their thoughts to sort of protect everything they're doing right. um but actually open it up to the more the, the community at large one of the greatest learnings that we had sort of imbibed before starting out was can we create collaboration through community that yeah that, um, that's really interesting to me and and is there an opportunity for the individual to know that look there are folks out there who may not be necessarily directly related to my business mm-hmm. but they can just suddenly give me such a crazy outsider view that i wouldn't ever get that i was because i was so close to my business right and maybe there's a business that's ancillary to mine where they can give me a, an outlook that i've never previously thought of but i also think like you know just founders sitting with each other and talking to each other right i think yeah. there is value in in that right cuz You know, people say founding is lonely. Right? I mean, like when yeah, you're right. the when you're the person running your company, it's you can't really talk that much to that many people about mm-hmm. every single aspect. But um, being around other founders does kind of allow you to be more open and talk about more specifics than you otherwise would. Do you think that's yeah. uh, kind of helped these uh, the guys working with you guys? Absolutely, absolutely. And I'll give you a, a more sort of contextual example of sure. what we've seen at Thinkubit over the last twelve months. So. If the the way those six companies that we have, the mm-hmm. startups that we have there right now, um, we have someone building AI powered chatbots for travel concierge at the outset, okay. and also now for influencer marketing okay. um, and fan engagement. Uh, we have a digital loyalty platform okay. with a CRM and marketing automation tool for SMEs and MSMEs. Okay. Who also now sort of done food POS integrations. Okay. Um, going into the payment space. we have someone doing fast fashion on the supply chain and sort of supply chain management and and complete end to end fulfillment of merchandising solutions in okay. fast fashion right. across just apparel okay um we have someone doing driving analytics someone doing smart water management and sort of infrastructure control and someone now doing portfolio management for real estate small scale landlords so it's so to the portfolio wise so uh, it's broad ex- yeah very very diverse right but we've actually tried to get them to like you were sort of uh, alluding to earlier cross pollinate in some ways right right so three of them are relatively more deep tech uh, with okay. with the sort of the underlying value proposition of the company mm-hmm. and hence the skill sets of those founders are perhaps a lot more technical right. in comparison mm-hmm. to a couple of the others right and what we've been able to do is so the 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 company that's making chatbots mm-hmm. uh, they're called superfan Uh, Superfan is building a bot solution for digital loyalty for hashtag loyalty, which is a loyalty company. Right, and they're actually helping wow. the merchants actually say that hey, you know what? Do you have another source of revenue to be able to create a bot for your independent mm-hmm. location? They're surveying those domains too, and how they could actually cross pollinate and distribute further. Right. Simultaneously, hashtag is actually able to provide a, a whole bunch of leads to Superfan uh, because Superfan is getting SMEs, influencers, right. celebrities, anybody who has a brand right. engage better. Every one of hashtags clients right. is a brand, right? So it's a just the most basic yet the most contextual example of how you could actually help each other if you just open yourself up. You need to know each other. You need, you need yeah. to spend time and talk so to each other. We actually stuff. propagated yeah. something at Thinkubate. So we have a, a sort of a pin board right up front when you enter the mm. space uh, with a events calendar and things like that. And we recently started on suggestion from someone in the community that can we just have an ask and offer system. Look, okay. we're just going to put up an ask and offer like plain white sheet on that board. Okay. Um every time somebody in the community needs something, put a note up there. Every time somebody wants to offer their time or their thoughts or their resources, put it up there. And nice. organically, we suddenly saw suggestions from the community benefiting the community. Hmm. And that's why we realized that that's the greatest success that we could possibly hope right, for, right, that right. they realize that they're all pulling for each other. No, and that, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's that's a, so that's amazing. a great benefit yeah. of. Uh, I mean, we I've even seen this. Uh, we uh, hip class works out of a co-working oh. space. So even there, even though you're not so ingrained and involved, I mean, having just a facility which brings a lot of other like-minded people oh, no, together it does. makes it a, does. makes a huge impact. And um, especially in your case, when you're a cohort where you literally not just share the space, but you also share resources, you share yeah. your time, you think together. Uh, I think it that. 
bids up a lot more. I yeah. 100% agree. I mean, like, so we spent our first six, eight months out as car social, right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, like, I uh, met a bunch of people who we still talk to yeah. regularly, who we still work with on a bunch of different things. So, I mean, like, yeah, just working with a lot of different companies when yeah. you're really small makes a lot of sense. It's right? exposure. Yeah, you, you meet people, you talk to them about things which you just would not otherwise Absolutely. get into. The way I want to understand what you guys are doing uniquely like again coming back to your 12 months what do you think if these guys were on their own uh if these guys started out in anywhere else uh, without the kind of support you were giving them contrast to that to what they are today like can you give us some examples of where they're going next i mean now they're all at the end of their 12 so months i today. think there was, i mean i could i could probably say that all these teams would have even done extremely well themselves i have absolutely no doubt about the fact that the founding teams are solid enough to have maybe in a little longer time frame maybe it would have taken them a little longer than 12 months to get where they are today mm-hmm. but i am pretty certain that they would have been still on their feet right. um which is honestly at the early stage the that's what you need that's, that's the name of the game much, yeah just every time you fall down get back up yeah. again and keep walking and yeah. and i'm happy to say that they're all in that scenario but as it stands today with the current cohort mm-hmm. four of them are perhaps a little further ahead than than the other two okay. uh when it comes to sort of even where the product is where the revenues are at and sort of uh whether at a stage to find a newer strategic investor resource whatever it may be one of them one of the four actually had already raised around uh when i got involved previously okay. so they have enough sort of runway um right. to sort of keep going <laughs> okay. um but um so two of the others are currently closing their follow on rounds they're okay. doing an angel round okay. um between 250 that was about two crores to 3 3 and a half crores okay um is what their angel round is at but i'm pro- sure more value than what they would have been 12 oh, months yeah. ago oh yeah absolutely yeah. i mean yeah. i'm not saying that they haven't optimized but at the mm-hmm. same time i think we've been very particular about not having just anybody writing a check right, right. it's extremely important to have strategic outlook right um even if you have a portion of your investors who are just writing a check right then there has to be a much larger proportion of investors who can actually bring value mm-hmm. um you have to find the balance yeah. right so that's that's been the outlook. two of them are are closing they'll be self sustaining and be already finding them offices and and space to work Stupid. out of Excellent. but at the same time i'm happy to say that nobody is sort of burning money okay and that for me is a massive success point because when you have resources and decision making right. authority sometimes it's easy to sort of not to realize when you're spending the money yeah. uh, especially when let's be honest the money is not yours right yeah. um so that i think has been a, a great sort of validation for us that they're very cognizant that's a good culture change you might yeah. have you know initiated in Maybe, them right, going yeah, forward yeah. also Maybe, like, yeah. that should uh, so i i just before we close i want to actually talk about since now you're an investor yourself uh, obviously as, by running an incubator you tend to see a diverse set of people portfolios you hear a lot of pitches what are the spaces going forward that you think uh, you personally are looking to be involved in and is promising for india because we we've spoken to a bunch of people here and we've spoken about offbeat investing and things which are not just another food tech uh, mm-hmm. company uh, <laughs> man so, we really kind of have nothing but contempt for food tech do we <laughs> until we get someone from food tech here who tells us otherwise uh, so so what do you think is what do you think is coming up for india i think there's a few underlying themes that we have perhaps been looking at very closely especially because we're very early stage right. um things like i mean so things like fintech when it comes to sort of urban mm. they're not necessarily our direct domain at this stage right. because they're perhaps a little ahead of the the they, the the industry in that sense is a little bit ahead of the curve than we sort of look at also think uh, fintech is kind of the uh, manpower cost of got to yeah. be exorbitant right i mean yeah. like to just get the right kind of people in yeah. and that feels like maybe you know i mean like uh, from what you said i mean like it feels like the kind of number that you would need to get into that space would be a little higher than what you guys are looking at initially absolutely and and what we've been trying to think of is how all of these elements can actually play on right. rural innovation so mm. f- for example if you talk of fintech in rural innovation can you talk of of payment activation and payment gateways built for offline transactions in far away marathwada mm-hmm. can can lack of data access even at this stage till complete broadband connectivity or data access in the country is about uh, what can we do to sort of um, power that can we we have no clue on consumption patterns of of actual direct consumption patterns right. of any sort of fmcg there's no fmcg company knows 
the actual minute element of consumption pattern. There's no macro trends yeah. right. and the understanding of that. And I think with rural innovation and and the well, the advent of the opportunity layer of India stack to some right. extent, it's given people the tools to say that, hey, you know what, I can play around with this a little bit. It may not be necessarily as robust as I'd want it to right. be, but I can perhaps unlock a little bit of value. Right. So we are very closely looking at sort of a marriage of hardware and software, where it's not necessarily just right. software that's, that's going yeah, that's to be the driver. I think that's, that, that, that's actually really cool because that is... Uh, I feel like some of that uh, I, uh, that that stuff gets a little bit lay, uh, uh, mm-hmm. laid aside, yeah. you know, uh, just in terms of uh, what because it's important, right? Without yeah. being able to, uh, and it's also where the potential for massive industries exists, right? Yeah. I mean, like if there's a hardware software match in some way, if you're, whether they're point of sale systems or whether whatever they may be, right? But I mean, like those things, I feel like. Uh, there is a lot of headway over here in yeah. terms of how much uh, growth possible there is yeah. for that so, kind of stuff. So sort of hardware, innovation, and agriculture. Yeah. yeah. Um, how can how can you marry the entire... There's something I came across with inland fisheries where you could just do complete, even up to 500 kilometers away from the coastline, you could actually create an inland fishery and automated solution for sort of... Cultivating fish. Cultivating yeah. fish. Wow. And I was just like, holy shit. Well, like, yeah. what? <laughs> yeah, I'm just like looking at you so, right now. So, I'm just like, what so, are we talking so, about? So there are people who are actually thinking outside of the box. Yeah. Uh, there are people so who suddenly are, there are farmers who are becoming fishermen. fishermen. Yeah. Yeah. In well, the middle of the country. Yeah. And that's I mean, crazy, yeah, right? I mean, like 500 meters from the, 500 kilometers from the coast means you're in the middle of the damn country. Insane. So there's some insane stuff that's going on, and we're trying to sort of look more in the the direction of of um, building for Bharat rather than building for India, yeah. uh-huh. and the underlying connotation that always goes through that. Right. What can we work on that activates the entire larger populace, mm-hmm. and where I'm perhaps not necessarily a, the target audience, because uh, we're all part of India as we yeah. sit here today, yeah. and. I feel like the minute we feel like we're part of the the consumer that means that uh, we've, catchment, we're, we're we've already cut off our market by like eighty eight percent. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so across healthcare, across mm-hmm. uh, sports tech, okay. uh, which is again a very very close outlook, mm-hmm. and sort of leveraging of of India's tech to a large extent is is where our relative co focus lies. But I think technology perhaps is more an underlying um, yeah. area that we're right. looking at. And I think we're extremely excited about. A uh, few interesting opportunities in blockchain that have actually come our way. Okay. Um, more one from the payment side uh, on a sort of a market making global payment mechanism, mm-hmm. and and second more on the sort of how can you create a reversed fact checking journalistic outlook. Um, so blockchain how, through fact checking. So yeah. So so interesting play on for news. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I've I've seen some really interesting that's interesting uh, in, interesting stuff that's, that's going on. Interesting. Um, and we're working sort of. Uh, closely and looking to actually help yeah. folks that are actually building this out because I don't think we we don't know what's going to happen. Mm. Like I, I don't think we could have predicted five years back that technology where it stands today would be where it necessarily is today and no. how right. fast things are sort of just like extrapolating to some extent. So it's going to be really interesting yeah. and I just feel like people thinking outside of the box are going to see loads of naysayers but loads of yeah. backers too simultaneously. Yeah. I, One of them could be you. Oh, well. <laughs> well, well, I don't think I'll ever say no to a good investment opportunity. So. <laughs> Great. On that note, where can people find you on Twitter, Pranav? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter myself, at Pranav Marva. Um, if anybody interested in following a little bit more tweets on cricket, I'm also at Cricket Gandu. Um, I'm also on Facebook as Cricket Gandu. Not been there for a while, reactivating it in a much larger way in a few weeks. Okay. We're also on Twitter and all social media profiles as at Thinkubate. Uh, follow us for sort of a little bit more insight into the culture we're trying to propagate there and the folks behind the, the, the magic. And also the, the you're doing a podcast of your own. As Absolutely. Well. So we've yeah. just recently started Think Talks, uh, mm-hmm. a simplistic uh, sort of video podcast on five folks uh, from industry, one from technology, one entrepreneur and one investor. Just talking about underlying issues uh, we're facing, seeing and trying to overcome in Startup India today. That's good, Anna. Uh, the more people doing podcasts, the happier I am. Absolutely. I mean, I was... So when, when Sheila mentioned that I had the... Op, like, he would love to have me over, I was over the moon because I think content creation is going to be the only way for anyone to start controlling the narrative. Yeah. And it's so, so important, even with each startup. Mm-hmm. And we keep yeah. pushing this to all of our startups. Create content. Yes. Yeah. Whatever form you want to create, yeah. get your voice out there. Yeah. Right. Thank you for having me, guys. No, that thanks so much, Pranav. I think this was a... a we already... Uh, I've been talking so much, I didn't realize how long it's been going on. But it's, it's been a great chat. And uh, I think uh, 
we really covered the kind of stuff we anyway do talk about and especially on this show uh, we try to make it more relevant to what we face every day right uh, whether you are an entrepreneur or an investor how to understand what what the challenges and opportunities are so thanks so much thanks so oh, much for pleasure. being thank here so and uh, amit do you want to talk about yes. where people can find us so uh, website uh, is ivmpodcast.com slash shunya1 over there you will find a button for the slack channel please uh, submit your email address i'll send you an invitation to that please join us on that channel besides that uh, we're available on all the major podcasting networks wherever you want to get them from, uh, wherever you get your podcast from you should be able to find our shows over there uh and uh, iTunes reviews please please yes. please do reviews on iTunes for us so those are very very important and i'm getting really annoyed that not that many people are doing them please please come on start oh doing them oh my god <laughs> all right <laughs> okay thanks so much guys thanks uh, thanks so much for being here and we'll uh, talk to you next week Good evening ladies and gentlemen this is your captain speaking sorry to say but there's been a slight delay due to the apocalypse having suddenly begun as you can see there's death destruction and chaos taking place all around us but don't you worry food and drinks will be served shortly and i would recommend checking out IVM podcasts to get some of your favorite indian podcasts we'll keep you going till this whole thing blows over thank you